Okay. Is everyone ready? Hello. That's good. Let's get started. It's not working, right? I'd like to use more of this, but somehow. Can you guys make this work? You're not going to mess up your muesli, right? Nope. Okay. Okay, let's get started. Uh, we're going to cover sequential logic design today. Last time we covered combinational logic. This week is going to be about sequential logic and timing. And we have our ag aggressive agenda today. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to cover. But by the end of uh, this lecture, you should know exactly all of the basic blocks that you really, really need to build a computer. Because you need both combinational logic to generate some outputs, and you need a mechanism to store them, have some memory. OK, this is uh, a big slide, but basically, please study some slides from lecture six on your own. These are relatively easy Verilog slides. You'll understand them easily. Uh, it's about Verilog syntax and how th some things are easy or not so easy. And this week, these are some of the reasons we've already discussed, like chapter five, if you remember. This week, we're going to cover sequential logic, hardware description languages in sequential logic, uh, and timing and verification. And next week, we're going to start more architectural concepts. We're going to talk about von Neumann architecture, LC3, and MIPS ISAs. OK, what we will learn today, this is just an overview. Hopefully, it'll be fun. Do you guys know about this stuff? Circuits that store information. Has anybody heard of RS Latch before reading it in our assignments? Yeah, you have. OK. OK, that's good. OK, basically, this is what we're going to learn. Circuits that can store information, circuits that have memory. Remember, a combinational circuit, the output depends only on the current input. You cannot store information. Information goes away as the inputs change. Basically, you want circuits that produce output depending on both the current input values as well as past values of the input storage elements, essentially. Circuits with memory. The key question we're going to answer here in this uh, lecture is, how, we de how do we design a circuit that can store information? So this is called a sequential circuit. The sequential circuit has two components. The essence is really the storage element, but you need some combinational logic to update the storage element. OK, well, we're going to start with some examples. We're going to start with this reset set or set reset latch. People call it RS latch or SR latch. It's just a convention. Uh, basically, this is the simplest implementation of an RS latch. Two NAND gates cross-coupled. This is called cross-coupled NAND gates. They're cross-coupled because their outputs feed each other's inputs, as you can see over here. This looks interesting, right? So what this does is it essentially traps some value, because the value gets, back, gets, uh, gets, gets fed back into the circuit. So if you study this a little bit, hopefully you have, you're doing your readings, you can see that the data is stored at Q, and the inverse of the data is stored at Q bar. Okay. And uh, in the steady state, if you want to capture the information and not change what's here, you need to hold both set and reset as one. So if set is one and reset is one, remember, this is a NAND gate. The, op uh, the input of an AND or an AND, if one of the inputs is one, the output is determined by the other input. Right? So other input really determines what your output is, if set and reset are one which means that the output is determined by what, whatever is already existent over here. And you can convince yourself that if this is one, let's, let's look at this. If this is one, uh, the output of this is really Q bar. If this is one, the output of this is really Q, assuming this is Q bar, right? Makes sense, right? It's basic logic. So we've captured the value Q over here. Now it's not that easy, as we will see. Basically, how do you set this? Uh, if you want to set this value, Q, to uh, 1, you need to drive S to 0. Basically, make S 0, but ensure that you keep reset at 1. If S is 0, you get a 1 out of here, and you will get a 0 out here. Okay. If you want to reset this, you drive R to 0 and S to 1, and you will see that you change Q to 0 in that case. Make sense? That's basic logic, actually. Now, you should never actually do this. You should never set us and R to zero. And we will cover this in more detail in the next lecture on timing and verification. But let's take a look at what, uh, what happens if S and R are both zero. So this is the truth table that we have for the sequential logic. If R and S are both one, 
The output Q, I'm going to show only one of the outputs over here because the other output is a complement of Q. The output Q is the previous value that you have stored in Q over here. If S is 0, R is 1, the output Q becomes 1. If S is 1, R is 0, the output becomes 0, and you ne should never do this here. So why should you not ever do that, set and reset equal to 0? Uh, what will happen is, if you do this, now the output of these gates are supposed to be 1. First of all, you violate an invariant, right? Whenever you violate an invariant, you should be very suspicious. I'm doing something wrong. It's clearly not the fact that uh, this is, uh, this is, both of these cannot be 1 at the same time if you study the circuit. Okay, the second issue is, which is related actually, if uh, when you actually uh, transition SNR back to one at the same time, let's say, you can never do it exactly at the same time, but it doesn't matter actually, even if you do, don't do it at the same time, you will run into this issue. Uh, let's assume that you transition, uh, you, you had these zero, zero, and you transition them back to one at the same time, what will happen is Q and Q prime will start to oscillate between one and zero, because their final values actually depend on each other. Because once you set S and R to 1, uh, you're, the, the, the output of this AND, and or NAND actually, is dependent on whatever is coming from the other inputs, right, for both of the ends. So you run into a situation called metastability or oscillation, and we will see that in a little bit more detail in the next lecture. So basically, your circuit becomes unpredictable. You should never do this. More to come uh, tomorrow. Is that clear? Maybe not that perfectly clear, but uh, you know now what not to do, right? Because you're breaking an invariant. OK, so how do you fix that problem? Basically, someone uh, may actually break this invariant, and they actually say R and S are both 0. We're going to disable that. How do we guarantee correct operation of this SR latch that we built? Well, we add two more NAND gates. Basically, we add a circuit that enables writing into this SR latch over here. I'm going to call this write enable, and D is our input now. Now, uh, if write enable is set to 1, Q gets assigned the value of D, and Q prime gets assigned the value of D prime or D bar, right? But only if write enable is set to 1. If write enable is set to 0, then S and R are both 1, right? As a result, Q equals Q previous, whatever you've written. And the beauty of this circuit is S and R can never be zero at the same time. Because you have only two options. D is zero, D is one, and right enable zero or one. So let's take a look at the truth table. If your right enable zero, D doesn't matter, so, uh, because your uh, S and R will be set to one. So Q is equal to whatever you previously stored over here. That's nice, you're not right enabling the latch. If your right enable is one, Q is equal to D, right? Basically Q gets assigned the value that you're trying to write into the latch. Now this is how we can store a 1 or 0 in an SR latch. And this is a stable, nice SR or RS latch. Now we're going to assume that this is a good latch. We're going to see later flip-flops which are going to make us uh, control things a little bit better. OK, make sense? Now we've stored one bit. Now we're going to build a register uh, out of these SR latches. Uh, basically, we want to store more data. This is the SR latch rotated. I rotated it this way. Uh, and I'm not going to show you Q bar. I'm going to assume that we're, we're only concerned with Qs over here. So if you want more data, you replicate it. Right. Now we have four, if, uh, four of these SR latches. Each of them provide one bit. Each of them have an input of one bit. And if you want to actually write four bits at a time, you can set a single write enable signal. And if you set the write enable signal to one, then all of these registers operate in parallel, and they latch the values that are given from, uh, from D0 to D3, as you can see over here. So it's beautiful. Now you can build an arbitrary large register, right? It could be a million bits. But this is just four bits. So the register is a structure that stores more than one bit and can be read from and written to. And we will see a, a register built differently a little bit later. So this is a four-bit register, as you can see. And we can abstract this. We can build abstraction levels, uh, as we've seen before, like this, right? Now we're actually abstracting logic. So this is really a module that you have that's built from these gates. And if you remember, you can actually, you should know how to build these NANDs from the transistors. Okay, so this is basically you have a write enable signal, and you have a data input, and you have a data output. Okay, now let's build some memory. Uh, let's make it uh, even more fun. So this is just one register, one four bits. What if we want to do 
multiple of these. Let's talk about memory elements. Memory basically consists of multiple locations. Uh, an example, memory array can have four locations. And for four locations, you need two bit addresses, right? Address 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. That's just an example over here. Uh, okay. And let's assume that each location stores eight bits. This is called the addressability. Uh, how, many, uh, uh, how, ma how many bits uh, does each location in memory store? In this case, the addressability is eight bits. So you can have a memory that's addressable uh, with 64 bits, for example. The addressability of a lot of the registers in modern systems is 64 bits. So the full set of unique locations in memory is referred to as address space. So in this case, the, our address space is four locations, right? Because we have only two bits for address. In many real systems, people have been increasing the size of the memory. The address space of big ISAs are, for example, at least two to the 48 locations. That's billions of locations, right? But let's, uh, let's start with this really simple memory. So how do we address memory? So we're going to implement a simple memory uh, array, three-bit addressability. Each location stores three bits, and an address space of two uh, locations. Essentially, you need an address, you need a single address bit to have an address space of two locations. So the total size of our memory is very small, six bits. And we're going to build it from uh, these registers, or, uh, yeah. And it's going to look like this, basically. Uh, if, conceptually, address zero will store these three bits, and address one will store these three bits. Okay? So how do we do that? Basically, uh, because there are two addresses, you need address size one bit, as I said. And let's separate these. These are our uh, registers, as I said, or SR latches. If you want to read from either this location or this location, what do you need? First of all, you need to decode the address. If the address is 0, you should read from this location, the three bits over here. If the address is 1, you should read from this location. Right? That's the purpose of this thing over here. This is called a decoder, essentially. And this is the word line. Word line really enables reading from uh, the register, the different bits of the register concurrently. So that's the decoder. In this case, we have only one bit, so the decoder is simple. Uh, if the address is zero, this, gets word, this word line gets activated. If you will, it'll get one. And as you can see over here, the output of this uh, uh, AND gate will be dependent on the output of this register. And now you can see what this is, right? This, the OR gate will be activated by this register, but not uh, by this register, by, but not by this one, because the word line of this will be set to zero, because we're reading from address zero. Uh, so this will be zero. If this is zero, then you get a zero over here. If this is zero, this becomes one, and you get the output of this register over here. Essentially, we've seen the structure before. This is really a multiplexer, right? It's, it, looks in a it looks like a different thing, but it's, this is really a multiplexer. Uh, you're multiplexing between either this register or this register. And uh, of course, for that to happen, your decoding needs to be correct. Only one of the word lines needs to be enabled. Make sense? Multiplexer, remember, it's a selector. We built this uh, in the last, uh, last week. It's selecting between this or this, depending on the value uh, of this word line and this word line. OK? So far, so good, right? And you do this regularly, right? It's, there's no magic. Basically, you replicate the same structure over here. You have another multiplexer here and you, another multiplexer here. So if you want to make this 64-bit uh, uh, addressable, you have 64 of these registers over here. And if you want to make this larger, clearly, you need to go this way, and you need to increase your address decoder. So we're going to take a look at that. But before we do take a look at that, let's take a look at how do we write to this memory uh, in this uh, structure. Again, we want to be able to write to only one address at a given time. How do we select the address and write to it? Basically, this is the circuitry. This is our registers again over here. Uh, this is our decoder, as you can see. And this is our write enable bit. So you need to do some decoding in the write enable bit. Uh, essentially, if the address is 0, and if you want to write to address 0, uh, you should set the write enable bit. Uh, this becomes a 1, and write enable bit is a 1. As a result, uh, you write enable this register. The, the D value that's input gets written here. 
But if address is zero, this becomes a zero. So even though your write enable may be one, you're not going to write over here because this becomes disabled. As you can see, this becomes zero. So you're not going to, this data doesn't get flashed into this register. Remember, write enable, if write enable is zero, the D doesn't get flashed into Q. We built that uh, earlier. Make sense? So basically what we're doing is we're really gating the write enable signal with the address, the coded address. If the address specifies this register, the write enable signal takes effect on that register, which means that on all of the bits, all of the SR latches associated with that register. Okay? So that's simple. Now we need to put it all together. We know how to uh, read from memory. This is what we did. This is the reading circuit, MUX. And this is the writing circuit, gated write enable signal. We just put those together to get our memory array. Our uh, two, two address, uh, three bits in each address memory array, six bit memory array. That's what it looks like. Okay. And now you can recognize the structures, you can go through it. It's all logical, right? Okay, and this is a bigger memory array, and you can make it bigger and bigger, as you can see. What, 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 did, what did we change over here to make it bigger? Well, if you can, you, now this, is, this has four locations, four addresses, so you need two bits for the address, which means that you need a wider decoder that can decode uh, two bits of address, and you need a wider MUX. Basically, as opposed to selecting from two locations, you need to select from four locations. You can only read one location at a time. So your MUX is wider, as you can see, multiplexer is wider, and your decoder is wider. And you still have the write enable circuitry, the gated write enable based on the address decoding logic. Okay? So well, I guess one more example. If you want to uh, read from uh, the third location over here, your address bit should be one zero, and one zero enables this word line now you can read from this location. Your write enable signal should be one, zero, of course, in that case. So only one location is enabled this way. Yes, question. Every time you write, you also read at the same time. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, every time you write, I guess you do read at the same time in this case, right? Because every time you write, uh, this gets enabled. Yeah, I guess that's true in this case, sure. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, the real memories are actually uh, a little bit more different. You may not be able to do that in real memories, but this is the basic building block. We will later see how to build real memories, or actually once you know these principles, you can actually build more. But that's a good observation. Okay, any other questions? Now you know how to build the basics of a memory based on SR latches. Now you could actually use something else inside here. It doesn't have to be an SR latch. It could be some other uh, storage element as we will see later on. Okay, now I'll, I'll, I can ask you one more question. What if you want to read two elements at the same time, two locations at the same time? What do you do? If you want to read from two different addresses at the same time, you add another decoder, right? So this is one address you're reading from. You replicate this decoder separately. Of course, you need to ensure your wires go correctly. You replicate your MUX. So you need to replicate these structures so that you can read from two different locations at the same time. Why you, you may want to do that, right, in a register file. Uh, when you want to get two data values, for example, and then if you want to add them later, you may want to read the memory at the same time at two different locations. Basically, replication enables you to do that. You replicate the address decoder, replicate the multiplexer. Now, that is called a port, actually. So in this case, we have one port to our memory, meaning we can only read uh, or write to uh, one location at any given time. If you want to do more, we want to add more ports. More ports mean more hardware. Replicate the address decoder, replicate the multiplexer. Okay, we will see that later on. So it's very powerful. All of these are building blocks, and you can, you can actually uh, build memories that are multi-ported. So for example, the register files and some of the processors that you use are eight-ported, or some of them are, were actually built to be 16-ported. So you can actually read 16 memory locations at the same time. 
Because why? Because you may actually execute eight instructions at the same time, each of them requiring two registers at the same time. Now, now you can imagine this is bigger, a larger hardware cost, right? It becomes a bigger memory. Okay. So I call this memory, but this is really generic memory. Uh, a lot of memory could be designed this way, and the, the technology, underlying technology can be very, very different. Remember, we talked about dynamic random access memory, DRAM? This could be DRAM also. Now, of course, there are a lot of tricks that are played today uh, in design to make this much more efficient, but conceptually, you need to have an address decoder and a multiplexer. And if you remember earlier lectures when we talked about memory performance attacks, for example, how do you read a bank? Essentially, we've gone inside that bank. You could, uh, you could superimpose this picture onto the bank that we talked about earlier, and essentially, what, that's what we're doing. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit more about sequential logic circuits. Uh, now that you know how to build memory, these are the basics. Uh, we've looked at designs of circuit elements that can store information. Now we're going to go deeper. Uh, we, we would like to build circuits that can actually remember past inputs and operate on them and do something useful after that. What, what is that useful? So one example of useful is this, right? Has anybody used this type of lock? It's a combinational lock, right? Basically, the output the, it depends only on the current inputs that you put over here. It doesn't remember what you do over time. Whereas this one, has anybody used this kind of lock? That's a sequential lock, right? I, I think this is a pain to use for me because I always forget what sequence do you do this. But it's, a, it's probably a little bit more secure, I don't know. Of course, it depends on the uh, alphabet space that you have over here too. But, but the key distinction is uh, this, the output, whether or not this opens, depends on past inputs, right? How you do, how you get to a particular state. So let's take, uh, this is the concept of state, basically. In order for this to work, this has to remember the past events. Essentially, if the passcode is you turn it right uh, to 13, and then turn it left to 22, and then turn it back right to 3, you need to perform a sequence of actions that go through a sequence of states to unlock this. Initially, the lock is not open. There are no, this is a state, basically. The lock is not open, and no relevant operations have been performed. Then uh, you do the right 13. You completed that, so you go into a different state. And then you do the left 22. You go into a different state. And then you do right 3. You go into a different state. And that state opens the lock. Now, if you do anything wrong over here, after right 13, if you do, for example, right 52, it goes back to the state over here, right? So it's a sequential lock. It really has a state machine. Basically, the, what is the state? So the state of a system is a snapshot of the all relevant elements of the system at the moment of that snapshot. Basically, uh, what you've done so far. For example, to open this lock, the states uh, must be completed in order. You need to move from state, let's assume that state A, you need to move from state A to B, B to C, B, C to D, and D to E. And then you go back to another state uh, to, uh, uh, to actually make, the, make sure you go back to A. Okay, if anything else happens, for example, if you do left five, the lock returns to state A. Okay, let's look at another example uh, that's a bit simpler, perhaps. Has anyone used traffic lights here? Do you drive? <laughs> so that's another state machine, basically. A standard Swiss traffic light has four states, for example. Uh, when I used to give this lecture uh, in Texas, uh, I used three states, actually, because I think the US lights are three states. In fact, I made the mistake of uh, uh, saying there are four states, uh, and people were very confused. Why are there four states uh, in a Texas traffic light? Because the fourth state doesn't exist. So this state exists, of course. Uh, green, yellow, red. That's a Texas traffic light for you, or a common US traffic light. But this state doesn't exist. <laughs> so this exists over here. This is prepared to go, right? Am I correct? Yeah, I'm correct. That's good. <laughs> I'm not misremembering uh, some, some other. Uh, I'm not confusing one place to another. So basically, even this has different state machines at different places. But essentially, these are different states, right? And you can, you can actually express this as a sequence of states. So you're moving from state A to B, B to C, C to D, and then you go back to A. This is sequencing through different states all the time, on a time basis. But we can make it smarter later on. We're going to make it smarter, actually. 
If you want to do a smart light, you don't do it, you don't transition from this state to this state on a time basis, but you transition from this state to this state maybe based on the presence of a car on this road, right? And we're going to build that finite state machine. But essentially what I've shown you over here, this is a finite state machine. It's not completely specified, but you can move from state to states based on some inputs. Input can be the movement of a time. Okay, so how do you change state in this case? We're going to talk about the notion of a clock. When should the light change from one state to another? Well, we need a clock that encodes the time to dictate when to change state. So this is a very common thing in sequential circuits. You need a clock to orchestrate when you go from one state to another state. You can think of this as the orchestrator. It really orchestrates state change. Uh, and this is a signal that's generated, and all of your machines have it. Uh, basically, it goes from uh, zero to one. It stays at uh, one for a while, and then goes to zero, and stays at one for a while, goes to zero. It's a periodic signal, alternates between zero and one. So at the start of a clock cycle, we're going to assume that at the start of a clock cycle, the system state changes. When you transition from uh, zero to one, at this point, system state changes. And we will later see how we can do that in a real circuit. And during a clock cycle, the state stays constant. So at this clock cycle, for example, at the beginning of the clock cycle, we go into state A. The state stays as green, let's say, if you go back over here. Yeah, this is green. The state stays green during this entire clock cycle. Now, when the clock goes from zero to one, you go to the state change. Now you become, what do you become? Yellow, right? Okay, good. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> if you design it wrong, you may actually cause problems, right? Uh, it becomes yellow, and it stays yellow for the entire clock cycle. And the next clock tick, this is also called a clock tick, at the beginning of the clock cycle, it changes to the state, and then so on and so forth. Now, in this tra traffic light example, we're assuming that the traffic light stays in each state an equal amount of time one clock cycle. You could make it multiple clock cycles by changing the state machine a little bit. By, say, by having a counter, for example. If you, you stay in the green state for, I don't know, five cycles, and then go into a yellow state, stay there for one cycle, and then stay in the red state for five cycles, dot, dot, dot. So you could actually make this arbitrarily complex, actually, by changing when you transition from state to state. Okay? Okay. Basically, clock, what is a clock? It's a general mechanism that triggers transition from one state to another in a sequential circuit. Uh, it's, the biggest benefit of it is it synchronizes state changes across many sequential elements. So if you actually think about many of these sequential elements, you need something that synchronizes things. And this will become more powerful in the future. So combinational logic evaluates for the length of the clock cycle. Now, it was not very obvious in this... Uh, um, in this thing over here, but we will see more of this later on. And clock cycles should be chosen to accommodate the maximum combinational circuit delay. Should, don't forget this. How do you choose that clock cycle? How long should it be? Uh, because you're doing some other stuff in parallel in your circuit. Th that thing should be settled by the time your clock cycle finishes. Right? That's the maximum combinational circuit delay. Remember this. We're going to get back to this for sure. Especially when we discuss timing, and also when we discuss uh, how to build uh, um, a machine. Okay, so I've actually introduced finite state machines, but let's be a little bit more formal about it. Basically, what's a finite state machine? It's a discrete time model of a stateful system. Stateful system means a system that remembers what happened in the past. Each state represents a snapshot of the system at a given time. And NFSM, finite state machine, pictorially shows the set of all possible states that the system can be in and how the system transitions from one state to another. So basically, you can express any stateful system with a finite state machine, uh, assuming you follow the next, what I'll describe in the next slide. Basically, you can model a traffic light, an elevator, a fan speed, a microprocessor. Later on, we will see the finite state machine for a simple microprocessor. You could actually summarize the operation of a microprocessor as a finite state machine, because you're really moving from state to state based on some inputs, and you're generating some outputs. We'll talk about outputs in a little bit also. Basically, a big advantage of this is it enables us to pictorially think of sta a stateful system using simple diagrams. Now, you can have many, many states. You can have millions of states. And in fact, an existing microprocessor has millions of states. But you could actually, if you want to, uh, pictorially represent even a complex micro microprocessor as a finite state machine. OK, so it's very powerful. So what does it consist of? It consists of five elements, a finite number of states. It has to be finite. Uh, like the algorithms we talked about earlier, right? 
The state is the snapshot of all the element, element elements of the system at the time of the sna snapshot. A finite number of external inputs, a finite number of external outputs, hopefully these are clear, an explicit specification of how you transition from one state to another, that's essentially called a state transition, and an explicit specification of what determines each external output value. So if you have all of these, you have a finite state machine. In the, uh, yeah, in the traffic light example, the output value is essentially the, uh, one of these lights, right? Which lights are turned on, right? You can encode them in some way. Basically, the green can be one or zero, red can be one or zero, yellow can be one or zero, right? Okay, so it's fun. Basically, you need three separate parts. You need uh, a state register to so store, uh, I'll, I'll show this picture. This is our state register in this case. It stores our state, basically. You need some next state logic that determines what will be the next state. This is the combinational logic that I talked about over here. Uh, and it takes some inputs and also the current state. And based on the inputs and the current state, your next state is determined. And you need some output logic that determines what is your output based on current state. Or your output can be based on current state as well as the inputs. So now we actually have two different types of machines. But this is a state register, as you can see. And at the beginning of the clock cycle, next state is latched into the state register. And you have the full clock cycle to evaluate this and to change your outputs, basically. Make sense? So this next state logic better fit into that clock cycle, how long that clock cycle is. That's what I was saying uh, earlier. This is combinational. OK. So basically, we need sequential circuits that look like this, the state registers. They store the current state and load the next state at the clock edge. We're going to assume that. Combinational circuits, it's essentially the next state logic. Based on the inputs and the current state, you get the next state. So you connect this over here. I did actually in the previous slide. It determines what the next state will be. And you need some output logic based on some inputs. It determines the outputs. Inputs can be the current state as well as the uh, external inputs that are coming in. OK, so let's look at the sequential circuits. And let's uh, first figure out whether uh, we can actually implement the state register we talked about uh, earlier using the D-latch, uh, using the D-latch we discussed earlier. So how can we implement the state register? What are the properties we want? Remember, I assume that we need to store the data at the beginning of the clock cycle, every clock cycle. So this clock transition determines when the, when the input is acquired and uh, stored uh, in, in the state register. And the data must be available during the entire clock cycle. It should not change. Even if the inputs may change, the, uh, uh, the, the last data, the state that, you, that you're currently in, should not change until the end of the clock cycle, until the beginning of the next clock cycle. These are two properties that you need for a finite state machine to work correctly. So basically, this is what you want. OK. Now let's take a look at the problem with the latches that we talked about earlier. Uh, the gate of the latch looks like this. Uh, we're going to put clock as our write enable signal. Now you can, do, you can be smarter and make it much better. We're going to make it much better. That's our goal, actually. So if you actually use your clock as your write enable signal, this doesn't give us the properties that we want. That's why we want to be smarter. And I'll give you an example of how we can be smarter. Basically, we cannot simply wire a clock to the write enable of a latch. Uh, let's take a look at why. When the clock is high, uh, Q will not take on D's value. right? And when the clock is low, the latch will propagate D to Q. We don't want that. Right? When the clock is low, we actually don't want this to change at all. Basically, this is what happens, actually. Uh, if, uh, we, we, we have a system that changes its output for a little part of the clock cycle because the input has changed. You don't want that. You don't want the input to directly propagate to output during a clock cycle. You want the input to be latched or change the current state only at the beginning of the clock cycle. And even if the input changes in the middle, we don't want the state to change at all. Right? That's, that's what's important for the finite state machine to work. And the D-Lash doesn't satisfy these properties. You should go and uh, work it out, and you'll see that it doesn't. It's transparent, basically. OK. Yeah, this is another example, actually. Uh, the input goes down over here in the middle of a clock cycle, and the input immediately gets reflected in the output which is not what we want, because we want the state to change only at the beginning of the clock cycle. So we're going to construct that. Basically, how can we change the latch, fix this, 
so that this D is observable at the output only at the beginning of the next clock cycle, or this is also called the rising edge of the clock. Uh, and Q is available for the entire clock cycle, full clock cycle, so that we can operate on it in the combination logic and determine the next state. Right. Okay, so this is exactly what we want. Uh, state change on clackage and data available for full cycle. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two latches. This is also called the D flip-flop. There are many types of flip-flops, but we're going to look at the D flip-flop and actually uh, your, uh, some of the backup slides contain some other flip-flops and certainly your readings contain a bunch of different flip-flops and latches. But basically, this is a circuit that satisfies these pr two properties. And I'm not going to run through it. Uh, I'm going to run through it quickly, but you will, in your readings, figure out how to do this. Uh, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to wire the clock to the right enables over here. Clock bar goes over here, the inverted clock. The clock goes to here. And when the clock is low, this master, what happens is when the clock is low, this D goes into this intermediate point over here. Basically, the D gets propagated into the output of this master latch. But this doesn't change. That's the key. The reason we did these two things is the real output of the register, or flip-flop, is over here. And we want to ensure that even though the input changes, this doesn't change. And that's what's happening over here. Even though the input actually changed, this doesn't change because this only changes when the clock is high. Okay? Only when the clock is high, the slave latches D, or Q stores D. Okay, so basically, uh, at the rising edge of the clock, when the clock goes from zero to one, Q gets assigned D. That's what we're gonna assume. But you can actually have multiple different types of flip-flops. Okay, I think I, I said this before. Basically, we're gonna assume that at the rising edge of the clock, when the clock goes from zero to one, the Q changes. Otherwise, Q doesn't change. That's exactly what we want. Okay, now, now we can use these flip-flops to implement the state register, right? Not the latches that we've discussed earlier. Any questions? Hopefully this is clear, right? Good. So what, what, what have we learned? Basically, we have two inputs, clock and D. And the function of this uh, flip-flop that's rising edge triggered is to sample D input on the rising edge of the clock. This is called the positive edge of the clock. You can actually build a negative edge triggered flip-flop also, but once you know the principles, it doesn't matter. Basically, at the positive edge of the clock, uh, when the clock rises from zero to one, that's what positive edge means, D passes through Q, so D gets slashed. Otherwise, D doesn't affect Q at all. Q holds its previous value, which means that Q changes only on the rising edge of the clock. So this is, an edge, this is also called an edge-triggered dev device because it's activated on the clock edge. Now, there are also level-triggered devices that which we're not going to get into over here, but some of your readings actually talk about those. Okay, make sense? No? Hopefully. <laughs> okay, you should do the readings if this, this doesn't make sense at the moment. <laughs> but remember, these are the two properties we want uh, in the end. Yeah, state change on the clock edge, and the data is available for the full clock cycle. And we did need something like the D flip-flop to enable this. Okay, so how do we build w wider items right now? Basically, you can have a register that has multiple parallel flip-flops, right? Each of which stores one bit. Essentially, this is our flip-flop. If you go back over here, you can ignore Q-bar because really we're interested in the Q, but you can actually output Q-bar also. You, could, uh, you, you always get the data element and its uh, complement but we're gonna ignore the, the complement over here. Essentially, this is our register that we built earlier. And you could show it this way. You have a four input data uh, value and four input, uh, four, four, four bits data input value and four bit data output value. And it satisfies the properties that we've discussed. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Now let's talk about uh, how do we build finite state machines using this. Essentially, next state is determined by the current state and the inputs. Right? There are two types of finite state machines that differ in the output logic, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, one looks like this. This is what we've seen earlier. This is called the Moore finite state machine. But basically, the key thing over here is 
the output is dependent on only the state. And in Mealy type of machine, the outputs depend on not only the state over here, the current state, but they also depend on the inputs. And you could always transform a Mealy machine to a Moore machine and vice versa. It, it just has different trade-offs. You may need to have more states, for example. Okay, so let's go through an example. We'll build a smarter uh, traffic light controller as opposed to the dumb one that we've seen earlier. What we've seen earlier, uh, basically, this is actually also in your book, uh, but what we've seen earlier transition based on time. Now we're going to take into account some traffic sensors. We have these two avenues, A Avenue and B Avenue, and the traffic sensors tell us whether there's traffic on the A Avenue or the B Avenue. So these two inputs, single bit, are set to true when there's traffic, and we have two outputs to control, whether uh, this uh, light at A, these are coupled lights, and the lights at B are red, yellow, or green. So clearly there are three states for each of the lights. So this is our black box of the traffic light controller. These are the two inputs, these are the two outputs. And outputs are actually two bits each, right, because there are three states. And assume that we can reset this. We're gonna talk about reset, but reset means whenever you assert the reset, reset signal, uh, you, set this, uh, you, you turn this into a known state, and we're gonna see, see this reset signal in our finite state machine, and we have the clock. Okay, these are our inputs, these are our outputs. So let's look at the uh, state transition diagram. Uh, we're gonna look at Moore FSM first, uh, and I'm gonna give you a break after uh, we're done with this example, uh, so hang on. It's, it's gonna be a fun example. Basically, Moore FSM outputs are labeled in each state. So states are our circles. So this is one state, for example. State zero, uh, the, this, this light has uh, green output, this light has red output. So hopefully you don't have any state where both of them are green, right? That's actually, if you, if you don't design your finite state machine right, so you may actually cause accidents here. So the finite state machines are actually useful for verifying the correctness of the circuit that you build as well. But we're not going to get into that. But basically this is our state. In this state, uh, the light here is green and the light here on B is red. Let's call that state zero. Let's assume that that's our state to begin with. Whenever you want to reset the system, for example, all of the lights got down, uh, you reset it and you start from this state. And transitions are arcs, so this is an arc basically. Whenever you get the reset signal, you transition into the state. Okay, let's see what happens if the, uh, if the traffic sensor over here detects that there's traffic here. Now this is not gonna be as smart as you would like probably. So if the traffic sensor over here detects that there's traffic on this avenue, it keeps staying in this state. May not be very smart, right? But okay, that's fine. <laughs> Smarter than maybe uh, what we had before. And if there's no traffic over here, it transitions into this S1 state where this turns into yellow and this is still red. Okay, we stay at the S1 state and at the clock edge, this is an unconditional transition. There's no input that's required. So you transition at the clock edge. Uh, you go to state two. And state two says, this is now red and this is green, okay? And as long as that's true, as long as there's, no, there's traffic in this B avenue, this TB is equal to one, you stay in the state. And if there's no traffic, you transition into S3, which is essentially this is red and this is yellow. And then at the clock edge, you transition back here. So this is our simple smart traffic light. It may not be as smart as you like, probably maybe you need to take into account other inputs, right, over here. But it basically takes into account whether there's traffic here and traffic there. So how do we build it? So basically we start with a tr state transition table. So this is our finite state machine, pictorially, FSM graph, uh, complete in this case. And we form a tra state transition table out of that. And you know how to form truth tables. State transition table is essentially an abstraction level built upon the truth table. It takes into account current state and the inputs, and it gives you the next state. Now let's take a look at an example. If your current state is S0, and if your input, uh, if your TA is zero, you need to transition into some state. It doesn't matter what TB is, because TB is not an input that's affecting the next state uh, while you're in S0, right? So if your current state is zero, if TA is zero, you go to S1, right? 
if your current state is S0, if TA is one, you go to, you stay in S0, okay? So you basically construct your state transition table this way. Now, as you can see, now we can, we can turn this into uh, a truth table. Let's assume that these are the state encodings. We'll talk about encodings, but clearly we have four states and we can encode uh, our state with two bits. So you need two bit registers for your state register. Right? Now, if you encode these, basically I'm gonna replace S0, S1, S2, S3 with 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. That's what you get. Now you have a truth table, right? Truth table in an interesting way. This is your state input, current state. This is your external input, and this is your output, essentially. Next state. Here we don't have explicit output signals. Outputs are encoded in the state. The state specifies what are your outputs, right? Uh, red and green. Okay, so we can now actually do what we've done last time. Last time, so how do we decide what's the logic for S1 prime? Basically, what is S1 prime? S1 and S2, S0 together encode the next state. So this is the, one of the bits uh, that encode the next state. If you want to look at how you compute that bit, how do we do that? Remember the sum of products form? That's essentially what we're going to do. We're gonna do sum of products. Basically, S1 is set to one only in these cases, and this is our complete input. That's what we're going to do, basically. This is our sum of products form, right? If you remember. Only in these lines. Basically, if S1 bar and S0, it doesn't matter what this is. And then S1, 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 S0 bar and TB bar, that's the second term. And the third term, you can figure it out on your own. Basically, we eliminated all of the X's, of course, right? X's don't, don't care, these are don't cares. Okay, that's our next state logic for one of the bits of the state, next state. And this is our next state logic for the other bit. Basically, that uh, S0, prime is one, only in these two rows, and you can express these two rows again in the sum of products form. So it's simple. Basically, we're building on what we've learned. Next state logic is combinational logic, and we already have a truth table for our combinational logic. Even though this is a stateful system, it, it, all of the fundamentals still apply. Right? So it's very simple. Now you can go and minimize this logic, and that's our minimization, basically. It's essentially an S1 XOR S0. You could have gotten to it through K-maps, right? You could express this through a Cornell map and then you could get this. Okay, so let's look at our output table also uh, relatively quickly. Uh, basically, in this case, our outputs are really encoded in the state, right? Uh, this state, this state, this state, this state. But we're gonna look at them differently. That's fine. Uh, later we'll talk about how to encode them in a different way. Uh, but basically, if your current state is this, your outputs are this. If it's zero, zero, uh, LA is green, LB is red. And you can encode them in some way, green, yellow, red. You need two bits to encode both of your outputs. Now we do the same thing, basically. Now you have four bit output. For LA, you have two bits. For LB, you have two bits. And now we're gonna look, we're gonna uh, derive the combinational logic or next uh, out output logic for each of these bits. LA1 is this, essentially S1, LA0 is this, LB1 is this, and LB0 is this. So that's pretty simple. We did exactly the same thing as before. So our schematic basically looks like this in the end. This is a Moore machine. The inputs don't affect the outputs. The, imp uh, the output is affected only by the state over here. So we need a state register that has two bits, that can store two bits. Uh, and this is our next state, and this is our current state. And this is the logic that we have. This is the next state logic that we have. It takes into account current state and the external inputs, the traffic sensors. Okay, and that's how you do it. Hopefully this is right, it looks right. And this is our output logic. Our output logic is dependent on only the current state over here, not the inputs. And that's our finite state machine. This is the thing that implements uh, the four state finite state machine for our smart traffic light. And you could do this for anything that you see in the world as long as you can express it as a finite state machine. Okay, so let's talk about timing very quickly and then I'll uh, give you a break over here. Uh, basically, you have all these signals over here and it takes time to actually uh, propagate them. We'll talk about this a lot more in the next lecture. But things don't happen instantaneously. 
So you need to give them enough time. For example, this reset signal over here. Reset signal becomes one. TA also becomes one at the same time. Uh, well, it takes time to propagate these signals. W what does that mean, propagate? Basically, you have some signal that's input. It takes time for that signal to change the logic over here, go through all of those transistors. It's not free, right? It, everything doesn't happen instantaneously. There's propagation delay. There's resistance, capacitance. Okay, so basically this is the timing diagram. When you do the reset, uh, you go into state zero over here. And then after some point, TB uh, changes over here. It doesn't matter if TB changes because our, uh, okay, TB goes up over here, but nothing happens because this state is not dependent on TB changing, but it's dependent on TA going down, becoming zero. So when TA becomes zero, that logic evaluates and it takes time for it to change state and so on and so forth. Okay, you can study this diagram. Okay, maybe let, let me finish this example and then we'll take a break. <laughs> we should talk about the state encoding also. These are relatively simple concepts. But uh, basically, they're, 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 we, we encoded these states with two bits, right? There are four states, and that's the minimum encoding that you can have. That's obvious, hopefully. That's the fully encoded form. But there are other encoded forms we'll talk about very quickly. So let's go back to Swiss traffic lights. Green, yellow, red, yellow plus red, four states. If you have fully encoded, you minimize the number of flip-flops, minimize the size of your register. But not necessarily the output logic or the next state logic. So in this case, you have log two uh, to the number of states. It's two bits if you have four states. But there's also one hot encoded. This could actually help you minimize some other thing, minimize the next state logic, for example, which I'm not going to go into, but you can take a look. Uh, basically, this maximizes the number of flip-flops. What does one hot encoded mean? Uh, Basically, you have four states, and each state gets a one in one location. Think of this as a bit vector, right? If you have four states, you have four bits, and you encode each state, uh, you encode which state you're in by setting the bit associated with that state to one, and everything else is zero. That's why it's called one hot. The state is encoded with the hot bit that's assigned to it, right? So you need four bits, clearly much more wasteful compared to this in terms of the flip-flops, but it actually minimizes the next state logic, the combination logic. That's why it could be useful. And you can study on your own why it minimizes the next state logic. But there's another encoding, this output encoded. It minimizes the output logic, and again, you can study on your own. This works only for Moore machines. We'll look at Mealy machines a little bit more later on. But basically, each state has to be encoded uniquely, but the outputs must be directly accessible in the state encoding. So remember, in our uh, example traffic lights, we had three outputs red, yellow, green, which means that we can actually have one bit encoding each of those outputs. We're not minimizing the output logic, we're we basically have three bits. Each bit represents a color. We could have done something else, of course, but now your states are distinct as well, right? Because your outputs and states are the same, meaning uh, uh, what, what th this means that your, your, state, uh, your outputs are only dependent on the state you can do this and your states could be encoded this way. Now you have three bits per state, and you can convince yourself that these actually map to the different four states uh, that we've seen. Okay, so these are outputs that are encoded. Okay, and clearly the designer must carefully choose an encoding scheme to optimize the design under given constraints. Depending on, for example, if your next state logic is huge, you do need to do a lot of work to actually determine what's your next state. You have a lot of external inputs, for example. You may want to encode your states using the one-hot encoding scheme. Right? If your next state logic is very little, then you may want to minimize your state register size by encoding your states, by minimizing uh, the number of bits you allocate to the state register. Okay, so this is a really good place to take a break for 15 minutes. And then we're gonna come back and learn a little bit more. Okay, so hopefully you now know what a finite state machine is, what sequential logic is. Now everything we built is very logical, right? There's no magic in any of this. Now we're gonna talk about Moore versus Mealy machines. Uh, now the distinction is not really, uh, it's, it's really a purist distinction. Uh, yeah, this is the wrong one. But basically, uh, we're gonna go through an example 
very quickly. This is also an example in your book. Uh, you have a snail that crawls down a paper tape with ones and zeros on it. I don't know why you want to have a, such a snail. It could be useful, maybe. And you could have the snail smile whenever the last four digits it has crawled over is uh, there 1101. <laughs> you can imagine. Uh, that's, a, that's a secret code between you and the snail, right? <laughs> if you want to make the snail smile, put a lot of 1101s. Okay. So this is essentially, you could essentially design different uh, FSMs of the snail's brain. And this is probably not a very intelligent brain the way we've defined it over here. Uh, Moore versus Mealy, as you remember. Let's see if this works. This is a fancy thing that I have now. This is a Mealy. Basically, the key difference is Moore FSM, the output doesn't depend on the input. It's only a function of the state. Here, the output is dependent on both the state and the input. And I lost my pointer. Okay, somewhere over there. Okay, so this is our Moore FSM, basically. Okay, I'm going to switch to this other pointer because it's very uncomfortable. If I do this, hopefully it should still work. Yeah, as you can see over here, or maybe I'll switch to this. You have a reset state, and if you see one, you go into some state. If you see another one after that, you go into some, some other state. If you see zero, you go into some other state. If you see another one, now you've seen one, one, zero, one, now you can smile. Smile is this output bit over here. And in all of the other states, your output bit is zero. This is a Moore machine because your output is directly determined by your state over here. It's not dependent on the input at a given state, right? So, okay, hopefully it's simple. And you can, you can verify that the state is correct. If you see a one and a zero, you go back to the previous state. Right? Basically, it's keeping track of how much of the 1101 string you've seen at any given point in time, right? Okay, so it's very powerful. Mealy is, now you can reduce the number of states, as you can see over here. In a Mealy FSM, the way you look at input, uh, the, the way you look at output is different. Now, this is the output bit over here. It's a function of state, so I can put it inside the state over here. It's not a function of the input. Now, in a Mealy FSM, the output is not just a function of the state, so there is no output associated with the state. The output is really a function of the state and the input. So basically, if you're in this state, and if you get an input one, you provide an output zero and transition into state one. Make sense? That's how you read this thing. And if you're in this state, and if you get an input one, you provide an output zero, because you have not so far seen one, one, zero, one, and transition into the, this state. And if you're in this state, and if you see an output zero, you transition into state three and still provide an output of zero. And if you're in this state and you see an output, uh, input one, you transition into this state and you provide an output of one, because now you've seen one, one, zero, one in sequence. Now the beauty of this machine is you go back to this state and not a separate state because this state is really encoding, uh, what have you seen? You have, you've seen, I guess, a one. You've definitely seen a one, right? One, one, zero, one. You've seen a one uh, at this point. Whereas here, because your state, uh, your output is a function, uh, because your output is a function uh, of your state, you needed this extra state over here. So a Moore FSM has five states over here, and this has four states. Make sense? because your output is not a function just of the state. It's a function of the input as well as the state. But you're, now you need to have uh, perhaps more logic uh, to determine your outputs. Okay, so what are the trade-offs? I've given you some of them. <laughs> so well, how do you design FSM? I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Basically, you need to determine all possible states of your machine. Develop a state transition diagram just like we did. So we developed this multiple different state transition diagrams. And your states can be more. For example, if you want to make your traffic light smarter, if you want to take into account failures, uh, let's say you have power failure. And power failure can be an input to your state machine. And from whatever state, whenever you see power failure, you transition into some other state where everything is black, right? And hopefully you have some other protocol for handling everything black, right? That's certainly a different state because you cannot generate an output, right? Uh, or I don't know, maybe if you have some, some sort of uh, functioning error, maybe you go into a state where things are just blinking red, right? I don't know if that happens in Switzerland. I, ha I don't drive 
but uh, this happens in some countries. Basically, if, if, if there's a malfunction somewhere in the system, you can jump into a state where uh, all, uh, the, the, all of the lights are blinking red. And the protocol is that if people see blinking red lights, they stop and they, uh, it's first come, first serve. They have a protocol among themselves, right? So you could actually keep adding more states and uh, inputs. Okay, certainly you need to determine the inputs and outputs for each state, figure out how to get from one state to another. So a, a good idea is to start from a reset state and uh, de determine what happens from it, and then keep adding transitions and states. And picking good state names is very important. S0, S1, S2, S3 may not be optimal, right? You may actually have a state name. I've seen a sequence of 1101 at this point, right? That's a state name, maybe a bit long. Basically, it's like programming, but it's not exactly like, uh, it's not programming itself, right? Uh, yeah, basically, it's as a sequential control flow-like program with conditionals and go-tos. Essentially, what the state transition is really a, potentially a conditional or unconditional transition based on the input values, right? Okay. Okay, you can uh, read that in more detail. Basically, we, we have many, many concurrent finite state machines in hardware. Some of them may be controlling this portion of the hardware, some of them may be controlling that portion. And a microprocessor itself is a huge finite state machine. Now we're gonna talk about uh, how to implement these in Verilog. I'm gonna dedicate the rest of this lecture. Hopefully we'll be able to cover most of the slides. But again, if you don't cover all of them, you should study and you, you're going to study this in your labs anyway. So how do you do this in Verilog? So far what we've seen in Verilog is this, right? Structural and behavioral modeling and combination logic constructs. We didn't see sequential logic. So we're gonna look at sequential logic constructs and developing test benches for simulation. And there'll be more tomorrow. So basically, we need the storage element in Verilog. And how do you do that? Uh, we can define blocks that have memory, the things we've seen. And sequential logic state transition is triggered by a clock event. So it can actually uh, define a clock in Verilog. Uh, and we've seen that latches are sensitive to the level of the sig signal, flip-flops are sensitive to the transitioning of clock, and we're gonna see how we uh, construct these. So there are two new constructs that we're going to see. Uh, one is always, and the other is positive edge and negative edge. So now you can imagine what these are. Positive edge, pos at the positive edge of a signal, we're gonna do something, right? at the transition of a signal. We didn't know how to say that before. Negative edge is also when the signal falls from one to zero, you do something. And always uh, describes us when we do this. Basically, this is the block that enables us to describe when a statement should be executed. This is a very powerful uh, block in Verilog. It says, always under these sensitivity conditions, execute the statement. Basically, whenever the event in the sensitivity list occurs, a statement is executed. And there could be many, many events that you can list over there. So let's take a look at one of them. This is our deep flip-flop that we've discussed, right? That we built from master and slave uh, D-latches, gated D-latches, right? In uh, Verilog, it's relatively easy. As you can see, this is behavioral, right? This is not giving you all the gate-level Verilog. Uh, basically, always at the positive edge of the clock, Q gets D. This is essentially our D flip-flop. It's very simple, right? It's beautiful. So a positive edge, as I said, defines a rising edge, transitioning from zero to one. We could have had a negative edge trigger, triggered flip-flop. That could be useful under some conditions. For example, you may want some other type parts of the state in a complex machine to change at the negative edge of the clock because you were doing something in the first half of the clock cycle and you're gonna do something else in the second half. Okay, I think I said this. The statement is executed when the clock signal rises. And once the clock signal rises, the value of D is copied to the value of Q. Now we're gonna look at this uh, less than equal. It's not really less than equal, it's an assignment statement. Uh, and we're gonna look at that, that's a non-blocking assignment. Okay, so a sign statement is not always used within an always block. You could uh, use them uh, separately, but we're, we're, this is a non-blocking assignment, and we will see the difference between blocking and non-blocking assignment very soon. Essentially, non-blocking assignment is whatever comes after this can be executed in parallel. It doesn't block whatever comes after that. Okay, so our, this is a reg. Assign variables need to be declared as reg. They're not registers. Maybe it's an unfortunate name over here. They could be registers, but they don't have to be. This is just a convention in Verilog. Uh, 
And again, we'll see examples later. Let's look at reset. Remember, reset is important. It's an important state. We need to be able to reset things. And these signals are used to initialize the hardware to a known state. At the beginning, like uh, when, you're, when you actually boot up your computer, the first state that everything goes into is reset. You have a reset signal, and you initialize things. And they're usually activated system start, but you can reset parts of a system while the system is running also. You could have a reset signal going to some of your registers, for example. So there are two types of reset. One is asynchronous. Asynchronous means asynchronously to the clock. The reset signal is sampled independently of the clock. It's not dependent. So it kind of gets the highest priority in this case. And we will talk about these things tomorrow, glitches and metastability. Uh, synchronous reset, on the other hand, this is, uh, here the reset is sim sampled with respect to the clock, together with the clock, basically. And this reset should be active long enough to get sampled at the clock edge. And this results in a completely synchronous circuit. Reset is not, basically everything is dependent on the clock in this case. So we're going to look at the example. So this is one example. Uh, this is asynchronous reset. Basically, this statement is executed whenever you have a positive edge of the clock, whenever the clock transitions from 0 to 1, or reset transitions from uh, negative edge, essentially, uh, or falling edge of reset, uh, reset going from 1 to 0. And if either of these happens, you evaluate this. Uh, and if the reset is 0, you assign Q to 0. Otherwise, this is like the flip-flop that we've seen. Uh, the, the Q assigns D. Uh, the Q gets D, essentially. So hopefully this is clear. When you have reset signal to 0, you're resetting. Otherwise, at the positive edge of the clock, uh, Q gets D. OK. So this is uh, based on style. It's good to have begin and end statements to improve readability. And I would, I would recommend that, actually, even though you don't really need it. Uh, in general, to improve readability and to mark the beginning and the end of the always blocks. OK. So in this case, first reset is checked. If reset is 0, Q is set to 0, as you can see. And it's asynchronous, because reset can happen independently of the clock, right? In this case, uh, this, this statement is executed either at the positive edge of clock or negative edge of reset, OK? And if there is no reset, then the regular assignment takes effect over here. So hopefully it's very simple. Now let's eliminate this negative edge reset from here. If we do that, this is synchronous reset. The reset is still sampled, but it's sampled only at the positive edge of the clock. Right? Basically, this always statement is executed only when clock goes from 0 to 1. And if when the clock goes from 0 to 1, reset is equal to 0, you reset the circuit, reset this bit. Well, in this case, it's uh, four bits, right? Not just one bit. Otherwise, if reset is 1 at the positive edge of the clock, you're not supposed to reset. You just sample uh, the input signal. So basically, you, uh, you, you put uh, Q gets the data input, as you can see. So again, again, reset happens only when the clock rises over here. And that's a synchronous reset. OK. So reset is just one example, right? You could actually have many, many other signals over here. Uh, you could have, I don't know, uh, negative edge of some other signal, right? It's very powerful, basically. This, this determines uh, when you actually sample your sequential circuit. OK, so this is another example, enable. Uh, basically, if you want to enable or disable a register, uh, in this case, a, a flip-flop, uh, with an enable, with asynchronous reset, you only propagate, you only uh, capture uh, value d into q if enable is set. Of course, either at the positive edge of the clock or negative edge of reset. But if there is negative edge of reset, you will never get here because uh, th that happens first. Okay, make sense? Enable is not in the sensitivity list. So if enable changes alone, nothing matters, right? So this statement doesn't get executed if enable changes. This statement gets executed if clock goes from uh, clock, uh, at the positive edge of clock or negative of edge of reset. And if you set enable at that time, this enable is useful. Otherwise, you could keep enable or keep changing it, and nothing matters if these are not changing. Make sense? So you could actually have inputs uh, that do not necessarily trigger state change, as you can see. But they could affect the value that gets captured into the state. 
Okay, so this is basically the uh, word uh, or, or uh, human language description of the circuit. Q gets T only when clock is rising and enable is one, at least this part. We don't talk about the reset part because we've discussed that. Okay, D latch on the other hand looks like this. Uh, basically, D latch that we've seen earlier, remember it doesn't, uh, it, had, it didn't have this nice property of data gets captured at the positive edge of clock and data, uh, the, the data that you store is available for the entire clock cycle. It didn't have this nice property. That's why we built this deep flip-flop. And this shows that it doesn't have that nice property over here in Verilog. Basically always, whenever clock changes and whenever D changes, you get this basically. If clock is high, Q gets D. So latch is essentially transparent, if you will, when the clock is one. And this happens always at a clock or D signal, right? So that's the transparent latch. You could have a latch uh, in Verilog also. Okay, so sequential statements so far. Basically, you, you can have sequential statements only within this always block. And sequential block is triggered when there's a change in the sensitivity list. So you should be very careful when you determine your sensitivity list. And signals assigned within an always must be declared as this reg construct. Remember, this is not a register. It's unfortunate naming, perhaps, on Verilog's part. Uh, it has some similarities to register. That's why it's named that way, but it's reg. And uh, we use this sort of assignments uh, in, inside the always block and not use assign within that block. But we're going to use blocking assignments uh, also soon. OK? And you will learn a lot more about this when you start programming, of course, in Verilog. Clearly, we can only do so much going through slides and describing your language, right? You have to learn the language uh, by making mistakes and uh, designing circuits on your own. Okay, so let's look at these always blocks in a little bit more detail. You can have as many always blocks as needed. That's the beauty. In fact, a real microprocessor has many, 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 many of these always blocks. So, for example, you sample uh, this, this particular register. Uh, uh, it, the special register gets D at the positive edge of clock. And this, uh, there's another register that gets Q, that gets, uh, this Q gets normal at the positive edge of clock also, right? And you could have many, many of these, right? And you could have combination logic over here, as you can see, this combination logic. What happens is you get the uh, complement of special becomes normal and normals, normal gets captured at the positive edge clock inside the Q. Okay, so hopefully it's obvious, right? And as you can see, you need to define uh, the things that are assigned in the always block as regs. But other combinational things are defined as wires. Make sense? So wire is combinational, reg is state storage. Think about it that way. Okay, assignment to the same signal in different always blocks is not allowed because these are actually concurrent. So Verilog is a very parallel language. All of these happen concurrently. They're evaluated concurrently. So if you have always at positive edge of clock special equals to D, and then if you say special gets normal, then you have a problem, right? What do you get? Actually, I don't know what happens in that case. Do you get an error in Verilog? Yeah, it gives you an error, hopefully. Of course, not all compilers may give you an error, right? If you have a bad compiler, you may not get an error, but you should get an error in that case. Okay. Uh, Okay, we've discussed this basically. Uh, this statement describes what happens to signal Q over here. But what happens when the clock is not rising, right? Not at the positive edge of clock. Basically, the value of Q is preserved. Whatever you, ha you had stored into Q, it stays there. That's the beauty of this register declaration. It only changes at the positive edge of clock. And if the positive edge of clock doesn't happen, when the clock is not rising, the value of Q is preserved. That's how you get memory in this. But you should be careful because always blocks are actually, don't, do not always memorize. <laughs> That's the interesting part over here. And they could still be useful even if they do not memorize. In this case, it's nice because it memorizes, meaning you have state storage. The Q preserves its value other times than uh, when this always block gets executed. Of course, you need to initialize it, dot, 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 which is not shown uh, over here, right? Uh, 
if you want to get a good value to, to sample. But if you look at this over here, in this case, uh, it's really not, not memorizing the result. It's always changing the result over here. Basically, this statement describes what happens to signal results, and this block is executed when in, you, have, you have invalid and data, not at the positive edge, not at the negative edge, always. Uh, these are the sensitivity list, basically. If invalid is true, result gets complement of data, otherwise result gets data, right? And that's exactly what I said over here. This is actually combinational. Result is assigned a value in all cases of the if and else block, always, right? Whenever you have uh, something, basically it's a combinational circuit with inputs, invalid and data, and output result. That's essentially what it is. And you can actually express this, you can actually write uh, what it looks like in circuits, right? Okay, hopefully this is clear. So you can actually have combinational blocks. I mean, these are actually cases where they could be useful, as I'll show you in a little bit, but these are actually cases where you can make mistakes also. You may want a sequential construct, you may get a combinational one. If you forget something, for example, if you forget the positive edge of invalid, I don't know. Uh, or you may get a sequential block when you want combinational. Right? So you gotta be very careful. Okay, so this always block defines combinational logic if all outputs are always continuously updated. That's the definition of combinational logic, right? All outputs are always continuously updated. You don't remember anything. Okay, well, what does this mean? All right-hand side signals are in the sensitivity list. Well, in this case, that's true. And, uh, oh, you can actually use always at uh, asterisk for short. Basically, always do this statement, regardless of whatever. Not at the positive edge of clock, all the time you execute the statement. And we'll see why this is useful. And all left-hand signals get assigned in every possible condition of if and else and case blocks. We will see case blocks over here. But basically, all left-hand signals are always assigned over here. Basically, all outputs are always assigned and all inputs uh, uh, are in the sensitivity list. Okay, so it's easy to make mistakes unintentionally describe latches or memorizing elements. And you may get warning, but you may not always get warning. It's better to be aware of this. Okay, we'll see these powerful combinational logic statements. We saw if and else, clearly. Uh, we'll see case in a little bit. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Are these sequential or combinational? Actually, this one. Does this define a sequential logic or combinational logic? Any thoughts? It's always executed, as you can see. There is no sensitivity list. Any guesses? Maybe you haven't programmed enough in Verilog yet. Yes? Uh, LP is not always set. Exactly. With, uh, uh, it's a complement of combinational, sequential, yes. <laughs> yeah, so you got it right, basically. There's no same assignment. Uh, I don't know what this enable means, yeah. Okay, but LP, uh, uh, LP oh yeah, that's right. LP is not always set, right, essentially, or not enable. Essentially, uh, you get uh, a sequential logic. You remember what out B was, right? Because out, B, out A, for example, is always set regardless of what the value of enable is. If enable is not true, out A will be uh, zero. Otherwise, out A will be overwritten with data. But you don't know, uh, basically you remember, if, if enable is not set over here, you remember the previous value of out B in this block. That's the idea over here. Okay, so you can easily make a mistake here, right, clearly. <laughs> if, if, if this is not your intention, if you really wanted to set out B, you forgot out B, and you got a sequential logic in the end. Now, this is another example. This may be harder to determine. What about this one? I guess yeah, I gave you an the answer over here, right? This is also sequential, because enable is not in the sensitivity list over here. Make sense? So this circuit, uh, this, this always block gets evaluated when data changes. So when data changes, you assign out A and out B. And when data ch 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 changes, you, you, you also look at enable. But uh, you don't sample enable, right? So if enable changes, and if data stays constant, nothing changes over here, right? So that's the, uh, that's the issue over here. Okay, 
Okay, so if you are in doubt, you should look over here. <laughs> Basically, all outputs are always continuously updated. That's your combination logic. And if you, all right-hand signals are in the sensitivity list and all left-hand signals get assigned in every possible condition. Okay. Okay, well then let's take a look at uh, always block. So always block is not always practical or nice. So this is one example. This is a multiplexer in always, A, B, cell. We've seen this before. If select is two, result is A, otherwise result is B, you're selecting between A and B. But this is kind of nicer, right? We've already seen how to do a multiplexer. This also is also correct. It's kind of convoluted. So it's more work and more prone to error, I will say. Okay, this is, uh, maybe this is a little bit more handy. Basically, always, it's always executed, and you have a case statement. Essentially, uh, you, you assign these different values uh, to segments uh, based on the case for the data, based on the value of the data, right? Data is four bits. If the data bits are this, uh, you, you give different values to the segment, seven bits output. And there's a default statement. It's always good to have default statements. What if the value is not uh, in this list? By default, you assign segments to all zeros, right? So this is one way of using the always block. You do a case statement. Okay. I already said this, and I already said this also, I think. Uh, yeah, if you, if you use case statements, use the default case to make sure you not for, forget an unimplemented case. This is good for any kind of programming, actually. If you have a case or switch case statement, in C, for example, you have a switch case statement, uh, it's always good to have a default case. And if you don't have the default case, you, you may actually have a latch in the end. Okay, you'll learn by making mistakes, perhaps. And you can use the case x statement to be able to check for it on cares. Okay, let's look at non-blocking and blocking assignments, because these are important. And again, these could be the cause of mistakes. You could easily miss this signal over here. So this is a non-blocking assignment, meaning all assignments are made in parallel, or you can think of it as all assignments in the always block are made at the end over here. Uh, and pro uh, the process flow is not blocked, meaning this doesn't wait for this to be executed. Meaning B gets the old value of A, if you will. Uh, the A changes uh, at the end over here after the old value of A is assigned to B, okay? Now, but the blocking assignment inserts sequential dependency, if you will, and it's this way. As you can see, this is a non-blocking assignment, it's a blocking assignment. In this case, this gets executed before this gets executed. Each assignment is made immediately and process waits until the first assignment is complete and basically assignment blocks progress. That's why this is called blocking. And they could both be useful, right? In this case, you want A to evaluate first and then get assigned to B, right? In this case, you don't want A to evaluate first. You want the old value of A to be assigned to B over here. And you can imagine different cases over here. Clearly, now you have, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so let's take a look at this blocking assignment. This is just some example. This is I execute always. Uh, and if A changes to one, uh, all values are updated in order, right? Basically, this is what you get. You get in order assignments because these are, each of these are executed one by one, right? Assume, assume that all inputs are initially zero. This is the result that you get. If you have the same code with a non-blocking assignment, if A changes to one, all assignments are concurrent, basically. Basically, uh, when S is being assigned over here, P is still zero, because P gets updated at the end of the block over here, right? So this is the value you get. So as opposed to getting what we got, one, one zero, one zero, for P, G, S, C out, we got one, zero, zero, zero. And which one is correct? It depends on what your intent is with the circuit, right? That's why you need to be very careful with the blocking and non-blocking assignments. Okay. Okay, so let's say at the end of, uh, after the first iteration, P changes to one. The P, the fact that P changes triggers the process again because the sensitivity list uh, essentially is everything, right? So the process triggers again this time. S is calculated with P equals one, and this is what you get at the end. So over time, 
you get different outputs depending on uh, what the assignments look like. Okay, you can go through this. You can, it's actually better if you do it on your own and see what happens right, when, you, when you simulate it or when you design it. Okay, these are some rules for a signal assignment. Uh, if you use always at positive edge of clock and non-blocking assignments, basically you're modeling synchronous sequential logic. Hopefully this is obvious. Uh, you're, you're, you're sampling at the positive edge of clock and you're non-blocking assignments, so all of your next, next state logic is executing uh, starting with the positive edge of the clock, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, this is non-blocking as you've seen. And uh, continuous assignments, uh, assign is used to model simple combination logic, and you know that uh, earlier, right? So this is essentially an AND, bitwise AND uh, over here. Okay, so some more rules. Uh, you can have model complication, complicated combination logic if you use always at star. You're sensitive to all of the inputs, basically. And blocking assignments. Now things are combinational, right? Uh, you cannot make assignments to the same signal in more than one always block or in a continuous assignment, as we've discussed earlier, right? This is not allowed. At pause edge of clock is also not allowed again. Uh, and this is also true over here. Okay, because you get confused, right? What do you do in that case? In fact, that's, what are you trying to express here, right? Because these are happening in parallel. Should A get B or should A get C? Same here. Should A get B or should A get C? Okay. So let's take a look at finite state machines in Verilog. We're not going to be able to cover everything, but these examples will be simple, so you can go through them on your own again. But let's take a look at a couple of examples. Remember, they call the slide. We can actually construct this in Verilog, and we're going to look at that. We call the slide also. We want sequential circuits, combinational circuits, and output logic. Let's look at one example, dividing the clock frequency by three. So basically, what it, what it means is this. Your clock uh, is normally, it is a clock cycle. We want to kind of extend that clock cycle this way. Right? Uh, the output Y is high for one clock cycle out of every three. In other words, the output divides the frequency of the clock by three. Okay? And this is one state machine that uh, does that, as you can see over here. Maybe you're going to supply the signal somewhere else so that uh, uh, some other traffic light is not going to change as frequently, right, if you think about it. Why would you want to do this? Right? There could be multiple reasons. But essentially, this is your circuit. Y is equal to 1 over here. Y is equal to 0. Y is equal to 0. Y is your new clock divided by 3. Right? And you have three states. And this is how you would do it, essentially. Parameters we didn't discuss last time, but you can actually parameterize a circuit. Uh, you should read the slides that I uh, put up online uh, at the end of last lecture. And you're going to do that for, this, uh, for these slides also. Basically, state and next state are two-bit registers. And the parameter descriptions are optional. It makes reading easier. That's why you have parameters. But this is essentially your state register, right? Uh, always at the positive edge of clock. Ignore the reset for now. Your state gets the next state. That's what this is, essentially. Uh, and reset is, uh, you're, you, you go into state as zero over here. This part defines a state register. And sensitive to only clock and reset. Uh, okay, we've already said the reset. Okay, this is the interesting case. Basically, this is our next state logic. Next state logic looks like this. Uh, the next state uh, gets S1 if we're in S0. If we're in S1, next state gets S2. If we're in S2, next state gets S0. Otherwise, next state is equal to S0. And this is purely combinational, as you can see. Next state logic is purely combinational. It takes state as input and uh, basically changes state. And this is our output logic. Basically, Q is equal to, if your state is S0, you get a 1. Otherwise, you get a 0. OK, basically, uh, this is a more type of SM. And this is the final example. You have another example, which you can go through on your own. This is a snail's brain, written in Verilog. Study it. Uh, but we're done with this lecture. Tomorrow we're going to cover timing and verification. Okay, see you tomorrow.